talk about his essay, so I'm going to keep this brief. Um, but I did want to welcome you. My name is Nicole Kraft. I'm an assistant professor in communication, and I'm also the director of Ohio State Sports and Society Initiative. The Sports and Society Initiative is uh, was developed by Arts and Sciences with the goal of really exploring topics that are important to the intersection of sport and society. So I'm curious, how many of you participate in sport in some way or have at some point in your lives participated in sport? All right, you're why we exist. If, if for anyone who it's not participating. How many of you watch it now, or in some way, sport touches your life on a weekly basis? Okay, so that's exactly why we created this initiative, is so that we can start to do research and have uh, large-scale discussions and small discussions, um, and really try to facilitate the opportunity for us to talk about the ways in which sport and society intersect with each other, and the ways that they affect our lives, and the ways that they will continue to. And this is an incredibly important topic that sports and society is very much privileged to be part of. So I welcome you tonight. I hope that you'll join us on April 19th, where we'll also uh, we'll have our spring panel, where we're going to look at the idea of professionalizing youth sports and the changes that have gone on in youth sports that's going to take place um, at the Union, and we'll be sure to send information out, and we hope that you'll be able to join us there. So welcome to you, and welcome to our panelists. Well, good evening. Good evening. Oh, let's try that again. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Thanks so much. I'm Eric Troy, the Program Director for the Keep the Key Buckeye Social Entrepreneurship Program. I'll be the moderator. For tonight. Thank you for the six that set up front, by the way. Got something for you guys later. We are excited that you guys are here uh, to have this conversation. We have a distinguished panel here to talk about diversity, media, leadership, and women in sports. This is not just a woman issue. Uh, glad to see the fellas in the house. Get the Ooh, fellas around. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> We had several calls of guys asking, can I come? <laughs> you know, and so it's important that we wanted to make sure that we also had a male perspective on this topic because it's not just a woman's perspective on diversity media and leadership in sports. And so our goal for you tonight is to walk away with a better understanding of your role, but more importantly, the experts that are on this panel, what they're currently doing now to pave the way for you. And so we're going to hold you accountable as students to make sure that you make contact with these individuals. They're not here just because we've asked them to be panelists. They're here because we all work for you. And I'll wait. I said we work for you. So take advantage of the resources that we have here to support this effort tonight. We're going to open up with a video that's going to set the tone, and we're going to have some Q&A. Uh, this is very uh, much interactive, so this is not going to be a lecture. Uh, those of you who know me, everyone in the room will participate. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> but you will participate in terms of your input and context. Um, before we get started, I do want to have the panelists actually introduce themselves, uh, give a little bit background of why they're here tonight, and a little bit more about what they'd like to share with you in terms of moving forward with this uh, initiative that we're starting tonight. Hello everyone, my name is Erica Haney. Um, I'm originally from Toledo, Ohio. Um, I played basketball at the University of Notre Dame, won a national championship in 2001. Um, graduated, went overseas to play a little basketball, played, um, coached at college about six seasons. Stopped doing that, became an educator and um, coaching travel ball in Miami. I've been there for the last uh, nine years. And I got the opportunity to coach at the Ohio State University. I took it. I was excited. Um, it was my coach from Notre Dame. He's the head coach here now. So I am proud to be here with this lovely group of young ladies. Good evening. My name is Roxanne Price, and I'm the director of compliance at the Ohio High School Athletic Association. And my background is a bit different because I'm a product of Title IX in the Title IX era. I didn't even get an opportunity to play organized basketball until I was a sophomore in high school because I went to a three-year high school. And when I played basketball, we played with the same ball that the men played with. We had no three-point shot, mm. and the men couldn't even dunk in high school. So when I have an opportunity to speak to individuals about sport, um, I grab that opportunity because so much has changed in the 40 years since I graduated from high school. And um, I just want to make sure that people understand that in order for women to move forward, a lot of the things that occur in sports have to be intentional and they have to be purposeful. Thank you for saying young, the young folks up here. I appreciate that. Yes, I'm yes, clearly yes. the <laughs> oldest person in the room. Uh, 
My name is Drew Hancock. My current title is Senior Associate Commissioner at the Big 12 Conference uh, based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm actually here in town for the Women's Final Four. Um, and uh, as a two-time graduate of Ohio State University and the, uh, um, the city of Dallas hosted this event last year. We had, if any of you watch women's basketball, we had probably the most iconic game ever played between Mississippi State and UConn in the semifinals yeah. <laughs> where little bitty hit the shot in overtime. And um, we are hoping for some good games uh, again tomorrow. I'm sorry the Bucks aren't here, but um, I've had a 40-year career uh, in, in college athletics. I've been very fortunate. I started out with a journalism master's degree here, uh, primarily because women weren't getting any coverage. Mm -hmm. So I got a job in sports information and got to work at the Lantern for a year. Um, and that started my career uh, as a coach and administrator and uh, ended up at Tennessee for eight years with a very legendary women's basketball coach named Pat Summit, mm -hmm. who passed away a few years ago, and unfortunately, um, from early onset Alzheimer's. But a great iconic role model for me um, even though we were about the same age. So um, I've been blessed to be a tournament director for three Final Fours and worked, um, I worked the Olympics a couple times, the two in the United States, I've done Pan Am games, but, um, and I say this with all sincerity, uh, I have a twin sister who's also an Ohio State grad. The best thing I ever got to do was, uh, was 10 years ago to provide access for my, uh, her daughter, my niece, and her parents to be able to go to San Antonio and watch her beloved Kansas Jayhawks win the national championship. Wow. And um, so Stephanie's now a, a VP, she's 34, she's a VP of the Goldman Sachs in Warsaw, Poland, mm -hmm. and she is hoping that the Jayhawks do the same thing Saturday night back in San Antonio. <laughs> so uh, one of the best things I think for all of us up here we would say is access. Mm -hmm. and, and what I hope that you all take from this tonight, as Eric said, is access. Um, I can't reach out to each one of you individually, but you can reach out to me. Mm -hmm. So when I tell you now, You'll have our email addresses. I say this when we have sport management people into our offices. Call me. You want to talk about your career path? You want to talk about anything. Um, and I really mean it. A lot of people say that and really don't. I really do. Just tell me you were here tonight, and I'll be happy to vote. Mentoring is what women of our ilk should be doing. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't have enough good mentors. In fact, the best mentors I've had in my life were men, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, not women. And that needs to change. So I have. As Frances McDormand said when she won the Oscar, bear with me, I got some things to say. So I'll, 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 let, her, I'll let these other ladies go and then we can, we can have a little Q&A. How's that? Thank you. Uh, uh, Thank good you. evening. My name is Karen Dennis and I'm a product of um, grassroots um, recreation programs because um, like Roxanne, we're, uh, I'm also a pre-Title IX um, person. And I really came through pre-Title IX and into the entry of Title IX. So my, um, from Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, woo -woo. Um, and I, I've uh, been at Ohio State for about 17 years. My, um, my root here came from um, coaching at Michigan State University for 10 years. I coached at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas for 10 years. And I've been here for 17 years, so I've been in the business for a while. Um, one of the things that really got me involved in, in track and field and as a coach was the, uh, my mentor, Dr. Nell Jackson, who uh, was a former Olympian and um, a strong advocate for women in sport. Um, my background in college was agriculture economics, hadn't planned on coaching. Didn't, didn't plan to do it. My mother always thought I should be a physical education teacher. I told her, I don't want to be no gym teacher. So <laughs> what am I doing now? Basically, I'm a gym teacher. But, uh, <laughs> so the, the, the moral of that story is listen to your mother. Um, but I've been here for 17 years. I've, I've been, I came in here as uh, um, an assistant coach in a combined program and um, then was a head coach in a, on the women's side and just over the past three years, the director of both the men and the women in track and field. So I've had a chance to coach internationally. I coached the 20, 2000 Olympic team, coached um, world championship games. Uh, you know, I've had some people make the Olympic games. So, but I'm all about, um, my passion is, is sports. My passion is, is women uh, getting into sports. And my passion is also men understanding how strong women leaders can be in sports. But don't be intimidated by us, yeah. you know. Right. So, um, you know, but I'm happy to be here tonight. Thank you, Karen. 
Hello everyone, I'm Alicia Graves and I'm the Assistant Sports Director at Lantern TV. I um, cover the Ohio State football and both men's and women's basketball team. This year I traveled um, to both home and away games. I covered the Cotton Bowl, the Big Ten Championship, the Big Ten Women's Basketball Championship, and the NFL Combine. And um, growing up, I honestly did not have a lot of women in sports media that I could look up to, but I knew from a young age that this is what I wanted to do. I was the sports managing editor at my high school newspaper. Um, I covered the women's lacrosse team for the Lantern as well, and I am the only woman on the Lantern sports team. And um, this season, traveling around and covering these different events, I noticed that not only is there not a lot of women, there's not a lot of African American women as well, and there's a uh, big lack of diversity and one of the big things that I'm very passionate about is getting um, representation in sports with both women and minorities as well because um, the way that sometimes women get treated and the ways that uh, the experiences that I have had this season covering the Ohio State football team um, not uh, women aren't always respected in sports and those are the biggest things that I'm really passionate about getting people to change Excellent. Thanks so much, panelists. We're going to start with the uh, video. Many people wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit the fashion model size. When I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. But I say, I'm a woman. Phenomenally, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips, it's the fire in my eyes, the flash of my teeth, the swing in my waist, the joy in my feet, because I'm a woman. students. First of all, when I came across this video, it, it really spoke to my spirit in terms of women at all levels, right? It wasn't just about sports. And so it's important that you understand, I think Alicia kind of uh, spoke to this, the perceptions of women in society, right? And this video spoke to me at different levels. But at the end of the day, that this girl can, but this woman can. And so my point to you tonight in just starting this context is don't ever say that you can't, right? Don't ever say that you can't be a part of this. Don't ever say that you can't be the first, but don't let that be the sentence. Be the beginning. And so, so often you talk about first generation being the only woman, being the only guy, or being the only person from my neighborhood. Let that be where you start. And so I think that video really kind of spoke to some of the points that we're going to be discussing tonight. What we're going to do is kind of put some context in place, and then we're going to ask some questions to the panelists. Before I forget also, I want us to give Drew Hancock She's going to get me for this, but she's also a recipient of this year's WBCA, which is the Women's uh, Basket, uh, Basketball Coaches Association Administrator of the Year Award. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> That's big time. And so uh, she's going to be recognized this weekend in Columbus. I wanted to make reference to that. 
Uh, I've read all these individuals' bios, so I know a little bit more about them than about me. I will also tell you that Lisa uh, does not play. She is a CrossFit trainer, so guys, don't go there. <laughs> um, so she may look small. Uh, I will also tell you that Roxanne Price is known as Little Giant. Uh, and so she will take you there. We had a chance to work at St. John Arena back in the days. Everybody knows what St. John Arena is? Okay, just make sure. Uh, and so I uh, wanted to let you guys know that. So you have greatness in the house in front of you, but also individuals who are committed to getting things done. So let's just give you a little bit of facts and then we'll put some things in context here. So Forrest put together the, a list of the world's highest paid athletes. Out of 100 athletes, uh, anybody want to read that? Who's number 51? Who is that? So out of 100, she was the only woman on the list, a Forbes list. What's wrong with that? Anybody okay with that? How about you? I think there should be more women because all women work hard in their sport, especially at that level. Sure, and we're going to make sure that you guys get a copy of this ranking so you can look at who was number one who was number two, but when it was surprising to me that it was only one woman on the entire list. And we're talking about being paid at 27 million, which means that men were being paid, we're gonna talk a little about that tonight, more than women. And I don't know, any tennis players in the house other than Drew Hancock? Any tennis players in the house? Hard work, right? So at the end of the day, she should be paid for that. So I wanted to bring that to your, to your attention. Let's talk about the Billionaire Women's Club. Oh, by the way, how many zeros are in billions? Parents don't ask. Okay, let's ask a question because we are on college campus. <laughs> How many zeros are in billion? Not, not. You sure? Yes. yes. Is that your final question? Final answer. Where's the comma going, billion? How many commas in the billion? Homework assignment. If you don't know how many zeros are in a billion, how are you going to become a billionaire? I think I just said something, right? Oh, we got a conversation now. Oh, wait a minute. So let's talk about the Billionaires Women Club. So Forrest came across this list, and I thought this was important because you need to know women who own, hear me, not play, who own the teams. Joan Tish, New York Giants, 3.3 billion. I love the second one. Martha, look at her name. Firestone Ford. I'll wait. <laughs> Firestone Ford. Tweak that one. 1.3 billion. Gail Miller, Utah Jazz, 1.4 billion. And then Denise York, York San Francisco Giants, 1.9 billion. All of these women, just examples. That's why I asked you about billions and zeros. But they were all married and they're all widows now. They inherited the wealth. What we're going to talk about tonight is you don't have to marry into wealth. You should bring wealth. I think I just said something. And wealth is not about money. Wealth is about having and knowing how to utilize your brain to gain wealth. But I want you to know the research, uh, guys and young ladies. You need to know what women are doing in this particular profession. So ESPN just came out with their dominant 20 list. Starting to get redundant a little bit, right? Tigers come back. Serena's there, LeBron's there. And this is the kind of research you need to do anytime. You don't have to be in sports, but you need to know what's happening around the society and the economy aspect to talk about it. ESPN Magazine 20th anniversary presented to 20 dominant athletes in the past two decades in order. Women represented as ESPN most dominant athletes. Look at the listing here. <coughs> Any familiar names? Serena, once again, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, look at you have four, Lauren Jackson, former what? WNBA player. Get familiar with these young ladies in terms of the dominant. And this is in the past two decades. So it kind of goes back to where are we in terms of numbers? And there's only what? Five or six women on that list. Not in the past semester, not in the past year. Two decades. We got some work to do. And lastly, the ESPN Magazine cover. Looks real familiar? She set the tone for the Olympics. So I wanted to give you some context there. So let's get into our questions. 
that there's only 2% of student athletes that are going to professional ranks. What are you doing to prepare students for the reality for life after sports? Roxanne, I'm gonna start with you on that. There's only 2% of student athletes going on the professional ranks. What are we doing to prepare students to prepare for life after sports? I know at the Ohio High School Athletic Association, we have a leadership conference and we actually hold it here on campus in Archie Griffin Ballroom. And our office is in Clintonville, so we're right down the street. So one thing we do is, and most of the individuals who attend the leadership conference are student athletes. And they're exposed to guest speakers um, from various walks of life, from various professions in journalism, business, communication, and the, and the like. And we also um, provide internships for many of our students. Uh, we probably got more interns and we have full-time employees mm -hmm. at our office. Um, they're interns in our corporate sponsorship area and marketing. There's interns in our uh, information area in regard to keeping our statistics and those type of things. But most of our interns are in event management. Um, because what the Ohio High School Athletic Association does, or what most people think about the Ohio High School Athletic Association, is when we have our state championships. So if you couldn't park last weekend, it's because we had our boys' state basketball championships at the Schottenstein Center. And when you're on spring break, we had our girls' championships. We also had our wrestling state championships here. So we need a lot of individuals to work those type of things because what you see in sport is what comes to the media, what comes to television. But most of what happens is behind the scenes. Um, and so we need, you know, we have individuals who basically work behind those scenes to make sure that our publications are correct and um, our marketing, our media, and those type of things. We even have some of our interns who do the radio, who do television for us uh, at the games um, and keep stats and those type of things. So we involve a lot of our student athletes and we have over 300 student athletes who participate in athletics in Ohio. And we're an organization that's seventh through 12th grade. So we just make sure that we have those leadership conferences. We have six around the state and the one here uh, at the, uh, Ohio State, so. Excellent. Yeah, uh, well, again, my first of all, I want to say it is, I've been in Columbus now for about six hours. It is so wonderful to hear people say the Ohio State, and nobody, <laughs> nobody rolls their eyes. Nobody, <laughs> you know, oh, gosh, she's one of those people. So it's really, it's really nice to hear you all say that. Uh, my comments will be really about the, the, the student-athlete space, not just well, students well, generally. But I think one thing that, um, that we have to do as administrators is, is and coaches is be honest with these kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, my gosh, you know, we have a better chance of being hit, each of us, by a meteor in our lifetime than a college kid has a chance of making a dime in professional athletics. Mm -hmm. But that's not what they think. Mm -hmm. They think there's that carrot out there, and, and it's such a small percentage. So I think that, uh, especially in the last five years or so, the NCAA's done a much better job of doing commercials and, you know, you're going to go pro in something other than sports, those kinds of things to not just be anecdotal, but show statistics about, you know, if, if you're that talented, you might have a, a, a really small shot, but there's nobody in this room, I don't know, well, it might be somebody else who might make a little money in, in, as a professional athlete, but probably not enough to make a career out of it. So, mm -hmm. you know, lean on other aspects, uh, you know, as Roxanne, of, 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 the, of the enterprise. Being in sports now is a very mm -hmm. sexy business. Mm -hmm. It just is. And when we have an entry-level position at the Big 12 or one of the major conferences, we'll have 300 people apply for it, and it's entry-level, you know? But know what your path is. Doesn't mean you have to know what your destination is. Just know, as you said, you knew at a very young age you want to be, you know, a broadcaster, and uh, of some uh, at, at some level. And once you know what what your end goal is, there are a lot of different ways to get there. Uh, and you're not going to get there. Trust me, on, on the first hit, you're gonna you're gonna be you you all very very young, very talented, obviously very bright because you wanted to come here and have free food tonight. That was very bright. Um, <laughs> And, and listen to us for a few minutes, but um, don't be afraid to take a chance because you're gonna you're, you're gonna have you're gonna fall in your space, whatever that space is eventually. So, you know, and and, and I will say this for the women in the room. Um, I'll give you an example. If you look at a successful high school or college football coach, generally, at their resume, they've been at six, seven, eight different places. Now they've probably had a woman supporting them to do that, but women. I have found through my career, women don't like to move very much. We're not movers and shakers. We're nesters, you know? And in athletics of any sort, you gotta be willing, that's true for men too, you gotta be willing to move up to move out. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
I think that it has to be something that you, you're willing to do instead of staying in positions for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. You know, it, our generation was a lot different. You did stay in a role for a long time, but now you don't, you know. Uh, and I just, the other thing I wanted to mention, Eric, we had a panel this afternoon that I was part of talking about the infiltration of, of technology in our business and in our world and that um, that the whole esports business right now is just huge. Yes. And what it's doing is the number of, of kids from the first question that we were asked, people of, who are over 40, was at what age do you give your, your child his or her first phone? The people over 40, you know what they said? 10. Mm -hmm. The people under 40, you know what they said? Three. <coughs> so that, that's, that's the world we live in. And if we're, if we're not cognizant of that, that's and if right. we don't embrace that, that every industry is about technology now. No, Everybody in the world. Yeah, you know. I think that's spot on. I want to add to that in terms of uh, the media impact. And so some of the research is addressing that from a technology standpoint. Lisa, I want you to kind of address this. So through some of this research, 91.5% of the sports editors uh, were white, but also 90.1% of the sports editors were men. Oh, wait. 90% of sports editors are men. And so as a only one for now woman in that particular case, what advice would you give uh, this audience tonight of how to break through that? And then all, of course, the panelists, to talk about how do we start changing that number from 90% and chipping away at it? Because it, the perspective is, do we ever get a woman's perspective if a man is always doing all the right? So can you address that? Yeah, I, one of the biggest things, um, and actually my dad used to send me a text before every game and he just told, he would always tell me, don't let anybody push you around. And that's the biggest thing. You have to demand respect. And I remember the first day I walked into a media availability, um, I got so many questions of why I was there. Um, um, you no know, other man, no new beat writers that came in that weren't there the previous year ever got questioned. Um, and people are gonna question you. And you have to be confident in saying, I work for whoever it is, and you know I would tell them exactly what I was doing. Um, and over time, I think people would see that I wasn't there to just stand around and just, I carried my own camera equipment everywhere. I set up my own stuff, I edit my own videos. And after a while, I kind of had to prove myself to people. Um, I think one of the biggest things before I, that I wish I, probably did wish I did better was instead of trying to prove myself to other people prove to myself first and that's the biggest advice know that you're capable of doing stuff because I questioned myself a lot of why I was there you know if this was something that I wanted to do but be confident because if you're placed in that position you're meant to be there mm -hmm. and that's the biggest thing have that confidence and I think over time my confidence started to show to other people um <clears throat> And people are going to make comments, uh, you know, and say things. There are a lot, a lot of times that people made disrespectful comments to me. Um, and you just kind of have to keep your head up and keep moving forward. Um, the biggest advice that I think someone gave me that I'd like to share is I sat down and I had an interview with someone, and he was just asking me about the position that I had. And the biggest thing he told me is, you as not only a woman but also an african-american woman but this applies to any woman that's trying to be in sports you um are making a path for the people that follow you and if i react in a certain way or i fall into the stereotypes that people have of me i'm gonna kind of mess it up for the people behind me because they're gonna say that's exactly why i didn't want to hide that's why we don't put women in sports that's exactly why we don't have African American, we don't hire African American women. And it's like, we as women just need to be confident and not give the people the reactions that they probably expect from you and the stereotypes they put on you because it kind of, we, we're making a path for each other. And that's the biggest thing and that's the reminder that I put in my head every day because I want more women to get involved. And I want more women to feel confident to go into this industry. So I always try to remember that I'm creating a path for other women to feel comfortable so that next year, if another woman walks in to cover that sport, 
that nobody has to question her of why she's there because she's there because she's supposed to be there and she has every reason to be there just like all the other men that are there and she knows exactly what she's doing and the other thing is there's a lot of men there that have never played football a day in their life and so <laughs> for anyone that wants to say oh they don't know anything about this they've never played the sport so be it because there's a lot of men that have never even <laughs> ran a route before so <laughs> just remember that too listen we're very proud that you're in that space i want to also add i'm going to talk to my uh, two coaches that are here too both with uh karen and, and, and erica so some of the research is talking almost 46 years later after title IX, more than 60 percent of all women's teams are still coached by men i'll repeat that more than 60 percent of all women's teams are still coached by men you ladies, of course, have that expertise in that particular field. Talk to us a little bit about how you got in that particular space, but also how do we start changing that 60% or, or decreasing that, if you will, and increasing that for, for women? Oh, wow, that's an interesting question. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I am woman, hear me roar. You know, like women, we have kind of demanded respect. We've demanded, you know, to be paid the same, you know, and now that women's basketball and other sports as well are becoming, you know, you know, exciting things and they're they're on TV, you know, they're more highly people are, are going after it. So now the women's basketball positions are paying more, you know? So now in this women type place, it's a lot of money to be made. So it's kind of like a situation now where, oh, you know, we can come over here and do this as well, you know? So it's just like, oh man. So I know like back in the day, like ninety percent of um, coaches were women, you know, and now it has gone down, you know, to I think less than 50%, you know, so it's a situation now where um, you can be in a situation coaching women's sports and you can make a lot of money. So, you know, and, and, and being a woman, you know, we have lots of things going on. We have families, we have our womanly responsibilities to, you know, a man like I actually, um, <clears throat> I came into coaching um, in 2003 and I coached for six years. Mm -hmm. And I moved three times. I started out at Chicago State University, and then I went to Louisiana Tech University, and then I went to um, Florida Golf Coach University. And there was a point where three years where I just moved. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, at some point, you know, I wanna start a family, I wanna have a husband, I wanna have kids, and I can't just keep moving and moving and moving and moving. And it's just like, all right, so maybe I'll get out of that. And I went into education, and it's just like, Man, you know, and now it's, I, I um, taught in Florida um, as an educator for about six years, and I'm just like, man, I'm still not married, and I don't have any kids. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, an opportunity to come back here, and I'm just like, well, maybe God has something else, you know, planned for me because I didn't get the man I wanted, I didn't have any kids, so what the heck? So, um, the opportunity to come back here is like, you know, it was awesome because I'm so passionate about what I do because I came from, you know, a very humble beginnings and pretty much the only way that I would make it to college would be through sports because my parents couldn't afford it, you know. So when I was able to do that, it kind of made me want to look back and say, hey, you know, maybe I can help other girls to get there. So I became a travel basketball coach in um, Miami and um, went and it's crazy because we have all kinds of girls, you know. I never saw some of their parents. We picked them up, we fed them, we did everything for them, you know, because someone did that for me, you know. So for me, the reason why I'm here and the reason why I do it is because I know that it, I'm here talking to you guys. I came from humble beginnings. I came from, my dad took care of our whole family making $25,000, $30,000, you know, so. For me, and the reason that I'm here, I'm here so that I can, you know, help the girls that want to get, you know, out and, and, and able because they have athletic talents and things like that. And I know I went way off, but I am so passionate about what I do. I love coaching and teaching, and I love to be around it. And, um, but, you know, I'm sorry. No, you're good. No, please. Okay. As I stated in, in my uh, statement, in my introduction is um, I've, I've never planned to go into sports. Um, agriculture economics was my field. Um, I thought I was going to help farmers um, find funding for um, 
for for their businesses. Um, but Dr. Nell Jackson asked me, I won a national championship while a student athlete at Michigan State University. She asked me to stay on, get my master's, and assist her in the program. So I decided <coughs> to do that. Been coaching ever since. I never, um, I, I never got out of the sport. But what really got me passionate about it is early in my recruiting, in the in the early years of my recruiting, I was losing recruits, and I didn't know why. And finally, one young lady who's really a, a outstanding athlete in New York, and I just she wanted to go to Iowa, and I'm like Iowa. Why do you want to go to Iowa? You know, I'm at Michigan State. What's at Iowa? And she said, Karen, I've never been coached by a woman. Wow. That's what she said. And I said, so I get penalized because of my gender. Mm. Game on. I was in all in then because I felt like mm. if girls won't come to a woman coach mm -hmm. because they've never been coached by a woman, I've got a, I've got a role in life. I have to change this. I have to assist in this in this transformation. And so Dr. Jackson, um, she left um, Michigan State University because she was formerly the athletic director at Michigan State. At the time, there were two athletic departments and men's athletic department and women's athletic department. And then when we came under the NCAA umbrella, they put a guy over her. She wasn't having it. So she left and the man who came in, he didn't know what to do. So he asked me, would, would you stay on and be the women's coach? Okay, I'll stay on. My mentor, also Jim Bibbs, who was the men's head coach at Michigan State and who was my grassroots coach when I was a kid, he was the first minority coach hired at Michigan State. So I, came in, helped Dr. Jackson. When I took the head job, Mr. Bibbs mentored me. He taught me everything I, I know about coaching in terms of people, managing people, motivating and encouraging young people. He was rapping then and he was, he's 89 now, but he was rapping back then. He could tell you a rap right now, but he always had sayings and he always was very encouraging. So. That's how I got started, by a girl telling me that she had never been coached by a, by a woman. And to this day, and you talk about you want to open up the door, honey, I hear you, but I'm telling you, I still hear, this is 30 years later, I still hear, who are you? Why are you here? Well, maybe they know, know who I am now, but I'm telling you, I have been at track meets and people have wanted to come in and just like we're sitting here like this now, and you're down there, Eric, at the end. Mm -hmm. Now I'm the one at the end, okay? And they'll pass by. Yep. All no, you're, there's a guy at the end, right, right. and and the people that wanted the media will come in and they will pass by. I've had a whole female co uh, coaching staff. They pass by every single one of us, and got to my volunteer coach, who was you, <laughs> and thought that that was that that that's the person in charge, and. He would have to say, oh, no, 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 <laughs> she's, the, she's the head, head coach. Yeah. And, and you know, I think that's a key point, and, and Drew and, and uh, Dr. Sandeff, we want you guys to weigh in. And this is why this conversation is so important. Look at the panel and look at the generational piece that's happening also in terms of those who have been at this for 30 plus years and those who are getting into it. Mm -hmm. Make sure you pay attention to the knowledge and the wisdom as I refer to it's on the panel. Drew and then uh, Roxanne, if you guys want to weigh in on it. I just want to add just a couple things. First of all, Dr. Neil Jackson was a freaking force of nature. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you, if she told me to do something, like she told you to coach, she sure did. I coach. There's no question. Yeah. She's yeah. an unbelievably yes. wonderful, wonderful woman. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for saying um, that. Yeah. Um, I just got this in the mail this week, and I, I don't have copies of it. You, you, you can, if you're a visual person, this is a report card that comes out every year. They've been doing it four years now. It's called Head Coaches of Women's Collegiate Teams. Mm -hmm. And they took the seven biggest conferences in the country, the Power Five conferences, including Big 12, ACC, Big 10, and then two others. There's 86 schools. And they gave a report card on how, how many women, to your point, how mm -hmm. many coaches of, of women's teams are women. And if you can look on here, to get an A, you had to be 70% or above. 
See how many schools are on there? Two. Two out of 86. There's a lot of D's and F's on this report card. <coughs> and I maintain that part of that is because women are not doing the hiring. Exactly. I mean, that's, 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 that's the deal, folks. Absolutely. I mean, we have to have more women athletic directors mm -hmm. and more women's coaches. And, yeah. and we're getting there, but it's a slow process because I think we're one generation removed from women making the decisions about who gets hired. And it is still, to your point, very much an old boys network. Mm -hmm. But the barriers are breaking down. Mm -hmm. It's a slow process. Every Everything where you want to have success in life is a slow process. But I think that's where the numbers are. Good, yeah, and, and I agree. Um, it's because of the individuals who are doing the hiring. I know at the Ohio High School Athletic Association, the reason why I'm there and my colleague is there is because they intentionally went after minority candidates. They only interviewed my minority candidates because we're 106 years old and the first 98 years you didn't have any um, as commissioners or directors. Um, and when I think about the NCAA, the reason why you have senior women's administrators is because I believe it was, it was mandated. mandated that you have senior was. women administrators. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any senior women administrators. You'd have senior administrators, but they might not be women. Um, and I think about the STEM movement, science, technology, energy, engineering, and math. The STEM movement is focused a lot on young females and getting them involved in science and technology. We almost need a movement to get women involved in coaching because of the individuals who are doing the hiring and even the belief in women themselves. I get reminded sometimes of the old Sanford and Son um, <laughs> sitcom. And I get mad every time I watch an episode mm -hmm. where Sanford didn't want anyone working on his teeth or anything else, mm -hmm. medical, that wasn't Caucasian. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the thought was that they could do it better. Mm -hmm. So we've got to believe as women that we can do it better. Not just as good, but better, because we have to be better. Right. And I never even thought about the salary piece, and she's correct, because right. Pat Summit was one of the first, and the Howard, I think there was a lawsuit at Howard, where mm -hmm. she says, wait a minute, I'm coach doing the same thing the male coach is doing. How come I'm not getting paid as much? Mm -hmm. And we know there's a gender gap sure. when it comes to pay, but we have to be intentional with it. Um, on our board of directors, we make sure we have a minority mm -hmm. and we have mm -hmm. a female rep mm -hmm. because that's now in our constitution mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. have to have such. Mm -hmm. The Rooney rule in the NFL, yeah. you know, but you only have to interview them. You don't have to hire them, <laughs> but at least they, you know you have an opportunity. So, I, I, I really love, and I'm going to open it up for some questions right now. I really love <laughs> the passion that, that is coming from the pounds. So you guys are not feeling that, but... but it's, it's warm in this room for a different reason. <laughs> Why not? Because these women are committed. But let's have some questions for the panelists right now in terms of things we discuss. Oh, this is going to be helpful for the um, for the audience. Um, prior to that, I just want to get at what I'm hearing um, implicitly, if not explicitly, especially uh, from from the panel and and Alicia. You, you kind of uh, hit on this or stressors mm -hmm. that. Um, women may disproportionately face uh, in their roles. Mm -hmm. And I want to see if you guys, as, if each of the panelists could address the issue of kind of stress, uh, stress or you know, kind of the, the mental health piece, mm -hmm. uh, what that may mm -hmm. result from issues related to family or the, the lack of, the less mm -hmm. interest in moving on to a different job in a different place, uh, if you talk about that, mm -hmm. or the desire to prove oneself uh, or, or the gain respect in oftentimes a more male dominated um, the area or the glass ceiling. So can you guys be, can you address the kind of mental health piece, the stressors that I'm sure many of you face and how um, the, the audience can maybe deal with those, some of those issues? I have a couple of brief ones about that one. Um, first of all, um, my first six years of coaching, recruiting is a really big deal. It's like the blood of your program. And you know, you, you go through the season with everything you have to do there, and then when you finally get a break, you actually want to take a break. But you really can't take a break because when you go on vacation, you're thinking about all those kids that are getting called by all these other coaches that you're losing. So you're with your significant other and you're hanging out and you're thinking about calling another kid or this big time kid or, or anything like that. You know, and if you're in a relationship and you constantly have to go on the road and they're just like, feeling neglected and all that kind of stuff. And it's just really tough personally. You see a lot of 
you know, single people in this business, and it's not by design, you know. But a situation like that, that, that that's the stressor that you're talking about. I know for me, when I actually got out of it, and I thought maybe going into education would be a little more fulfilling because it was nice. I had the same address for six years in a row. It, I mean, it's a big thing. Imagine moving your entire house from Florida to Ohio to, you know, anywhere, and you have to keep continually moving, and you're trying to build something. And then not to mention having a significant other that can't just pick up their job and go where you're going. So, you know, it's a situation to where you have to kind of figure out what you love. But I love coaching so much and I love being able to mentor girls so much that I came back to this craziness, you know. So the stressor, you kind of got it. It's, it's a lot of give and take. It's a lot. And for me, I worked mostly on and uh, NCAA institutions. I got my start at the University of Virginia. And when I got my start at the University of Virginia, I'm also a two-time Ohio State grad. And uh, I was in academic support. Now that's where females can get a job, yep. in yep. academic yep. counseling, you know, yep. because we're the counselor type. So, you know, you have to sit there with the student athletes and help them progress towards a degree. So, but you know, and that's where I got my start. And I worked study tables Sunday night through Thursday night. Um, 8 to 10 at that time and then I went to University of Akron and it was 7.30 to 10 so I understand being single because um, people always tell me you'll never get married with those hours mm -hmm. and I never did um, but in academic support you work so many hours and I will tell you if you look at the pay scale in an athletic department mm -hmm. those individuals work a lot of hours and they get the less pay mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of stress in academic support because I, I used to tell student athletes you can rehab a knee, but if you're academically ineligible, you're probably sitting a season. So, um, and that's how I would get them. And I would tell them the transcript has your name on it, not mine. Um, but so there was stressors there. And I also, fortunately or unfortunately, was the first individual at the University of Akron to work with student athletes mm -hmm. because they went to Division One when they hired Jerry Faust. So they and Division One programs have to have academic support. So you got to prove yourself because first of all, there's individuals in house who apply for the job and didn't get it. And then when I came to Ohio State, I was the first minority counselor they had. And you just always, and even at my current job, because they decided they wanted to hire an African American as the African American female, and also be an African American. Well, you know, I was one of the first ones here because I don't believe in CP time. Hey. Um, so. Um, and just the you know wherever I go, make sure I'm early and then and then I'm proving myself. And never on time. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it, there there are a lot of stressors um, in athletics, and she's right. Um, you don't want to move all the time. You want roots and those type of things. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't remember the coach's name at Kentucky, African American uh, African American female coach, and she ended up was coached and went to broadcasting. Who basically gave up those positions because of the travel. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just in you and I, you know, I work out a lot to help deal with those stressors. Well, I'll, I'll give about a 30 second answer because I, I'm not really qualified for this because I'm single and I, and I, I, I coached uh, for three years, but I quit coaching because uh, I was coaching tennis at the University mm -hmm. of Missouri mm -hmm. and I had a kid come off the court one day who lost a match 6061 who should have won. And I said, what, what happened out there? And she said, the girl's skirt bothered me. So I figured out really early in my career coaching probably was not, and I think there are young women, young women alive today because I did not choose that career path. But, um, but I think to your point, I mean, if, if coaching's in your blood and coaching's what you want to do, then there are those stressors and there are those decisions you have to make. But there are other avenues, as you mentioned, there are other parts of an athletic department sure. or the athletic field that you can get into. And I'm gonna tell you right now, y'all want to pick, pick a profession where you can stay in shape, make a lot of money, mm -hmm. Be an official. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. right. you know, yep. There is a lot of money to be yeah. made in, in women's and men's basketball officiating. I can tell you that. And so. you can start at the Ohio High School Athletic Association. There you go. There you go. So, so you ought to pick up on that pitch, but she is hard. And I know, uh, and I know this in terms of the research, but with Karen, I know her daughter is actually in that particular field and has a doctorate in this particular area of mental health. Um, so I did a little homework. And I know if you can address uh, Dr. P's question on that, but I know that is something that's near and dear because your daughter actually has that particular profession in the background. And I'm a single, a single mother, mm -hmm. been a single mother, but I also have a relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's been a, a long time relationship. 
because I figure I'm worth coming home to. And so, you know, I'm worth you waiting for me to come home to. That's the way I figure. But listen, on that's a different workshop. <laughs> That's good email now, too. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the real, though, you know what? I think, um, and, and it, the thing about coaching, you know, you do have to go where the job is, you know? And I, and I try to, when I talk to young people who are interested in coaching, and one of the things I do tell them to do is don't go into coaching. I, I, I tell them to go into um, administration. Mm -hmm. Because in track and field, we talk about the 50s and the 60 percent. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the position that I have is a dual gender program. There are 3 percent of women who are doing what I'm doing. That's right. Three. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so that's another reason why I, I kind of stay in here. But, but getting back to, getting back to um, the pressure, mm -hmm. you know, you have to have a support system. Mm -hmm. You know, Coach Bibbs was my support system. He had six kids at home. His wife was the um, uh, director of the ACLU in, in Michigan. Her boss was the mate, was the governor. All right, they had six kids. I take my kid over there. One more didn't matter. All right, <laughs> but but they had they had um, a loving home. Um, she had a great education. Um, I missed a lot of her life, and I also tell young young coaches, don't do that. You know, take time to get to your birthdays. My daughter's birthday mm -hmm. fell on our national championships every year, still does. But it was until about six years ago, she had breast cancer mm -hmm. and I decided I'm not missing another one of her, birth her birthdays. And so now what I do is I celebrate her birthday and then I fly from Washington DC to wherever the national championships are. Mm -hmm. There's pressure, but you've got to have a support system and you also have to exercise, you have to meditate, you have to really just leave the sport sometimes. You know, I like cooking. That 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 relaxes me. So I'll go home and I'll and I'll cook all day on Sunday for the whole week. And that way I don't have to leave my office because I've got food. My daughter grew up on campuses. She grew up on the campus of Michigan State University. She was always surrounded by educators and achievement oriented people. And so when she went on and got her doctorate, um, I call her now. When these young people, I can't understand them, I call Dr. Dennis. <laughs> I need help. And she'll say, Mom, I don't have time now. Or if she's had a full day of, of clients, mm. you know, then she'll say, give me an hour because I don't want to talk. And I give her the hour and then she'll give me a call back. And we'll discuss some of the challenges. These young people have, have, have issues. You, you, it's, it's amazing to me. And when we talk about um, the pressure of the job, it's not just the pressure of wins and losses. It's the pressure of managing young people's lives, you know, because we're responsible for their academics as coaches. We're responsible for their athletic success, we're responsible for their emotional well-being. We're responsible for their social um uh, improvement for them to be engaged outside of athletics while also being able to um, be a part of the university and the, and, the, and the community of Columbus. We're responsible for a lot of their life. So it's a lot of pressure, but at the same time, you have to, you have to still have your families. And then I also tell you young people, if you want to want to coach and you got a guy, make sure they have transferable skills. Mine was a pharmacist. He can go anywhere I am and get a job or go get an MBA. Do something where you've got some transferable skills. Don't feel like I can't do this because my husband or my partner can't do anything, you know, won't have to move. Make sure they get some transferable skills. I like this. <laughs> Questions? Please. Um, and you kind of already touched the base. Can you state your name and how much uh, you need for tuition? And <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Santiara Hudson, and I was blessed to not have to pay for tuition. Awesome. Right. Awesome. Um, awesome. 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 Um, but I was just wondering if at times you felt like um, mm -hmm. you had to limit yourself or limit your potential because of the pressures of mm -hmm. people saying, oh, are you going to have a family or relationships that you may have? I know uh, Ms. Haney you touched based on it a little bit, mm -hmm. um, saying that you that's what you wanted, but did you ever feel pressure 
Mm -hmm. um, coming into your career and going through your career um, with outside people saying, oh, are you ever going to have a family or you shouldn't do this because you may or may not be single? Yeah, absolutely. Like my dad, he tries to hook me up every day. <laughs> I have so many pictures of guys in my phone. Like, how about this one? What about this one? And I'm just like, Dad, I am happy. I think that my calling is to be a mentor to these young women. I feel like I haven't found that person because it's not my time. I still have more work to do. And the way that everything worked with me getting a job at Ohio State, it just let me further know that I am supposed to be here. These girls need me. I feel like our team this year, we were kind of everywhere emotionally. And me, I am a relationship person. Like being an educator for six years, I was in middle school as a math and a PE teacher. So you really have to connect with people in order to teach them. And that was one of the big takeaways that I got from being an educator, now a coach. So it was kind of a situation to where it's just like, oh my gosh, I gotta figure out, am I going to be a wife? Am I going to be a coach? Am I going to live up to what everybody else is saying what I should be? But I'm happy coaching. That's what I love to do. I mean, I do want to have a family someday, but you know what? I'm not going to force it. So I think I have become accepting of who I am. And I have, I pray, I'm not a religious person. I pray and I ask Lord for direction and guidance. And I say, you know what? Let me just go with whatever path that you have for me. And I'm going to go that path. No matter what everyone, oh my gosh, you're 38 and you're not married and you don't have any kids? What is wrong with you? I'm living a dream, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I have a good time. I don't know what you're and talking you about. Help, and we help the parents live the dream when we, yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm a first generation mm -hmm. college kid in regard to my immediate family. So mm -hmm. I would never have felt the pressure of getting married because they were so proud of the fact that I'd gone to college and got a career. Mm -hmm. So um, they never would have asked me to put that. Um, plus, I have a twin sister as well, and, and uh, you know, I have a nephew. Of course, he's 31 now, so I don't have the pressure of of having any children because at least there's one grandchild. So, <laughs> hey, Heather, I, I I need your help though, because um, I find that such an interesting question. It, it, what, I'm I'm astonished that that would still be true now, and so I need you to tell me it's not. Okay, so what that that pressure? that you would feel pressure to have a family, or I mean, it's in it, in the world today, um, is that well, still there? Personally, I've had some family members question it, but I've also lost or left. I don't want to say lost because it wasn't a loss. Um, I left a relationship because. Okay, guys, guys, okay, guys. They were here. Okay. Um, but because of the fact that I had my own goals that I wanted to aspire to. Yes. Um, and word for word, I wasn't there with his dinner ready when he was dating. Oh, no. I had a guy. I dated a guy who said he was my dinner. Um, but I was just wondering if that's still something that, or if that was something that you guys had to deal with and um, how to, how you guys felt about other people questioning your limiting goals. So, so, no, please, you might want to No, Eric, Eric, how you doing over there? I'm doing great. <laughs> no, I'm already making yeah, notes. I'm trying to get dates right now. The yeah. situation of the conversation, I'm looking at, I'll say Nicole and others because it's just, I mean, I love it, and I think it's great. And I think the other thing I'm hearing, too, is that although it is 40-plus years later, there's still some current issues mm -hmm. that need to be addressed. But the other thing that I want to also say, it's a balance. At the end of the day, you, you have to make decisions at the appropriate time mm -hmm. to make sure what is good for you. And, that's, and there's a difference between having a passion and getting a job. This is passion in front of you. And at the end of the day, those are things that happen. Nicole? Yeah, curious, um, just to shift a little bit. You know, one thing that's amazing about today is, and some of you mm -hmm. said, Eric, about you're here to help these young women, and you know, mm -hmm. Alyssa, I get, I'm really grateful to spend a lot of time with her, and, and I hope mm -hmm. that, you know, the conversations we have help her, but <coughs> mentorship of women um, yeah. with women yeah. is a relatively new phenomenon, and, you know, when you mentioned, yeah. Karen, that your mentors were men, so am I, because there weren't women mm -hmm. who were going sure. to help me, sure. and the women, and I think, you know, Alyssa and I just talked about this earlier, that there's a lot of competition still among women mm -hmm. with women. Female success means that other female is not successful in a lot of people's mm -hmm. So how do you, what are your kind of thoughts on that and how, how do women of this generation kind of balance that and, and mm -hmm. break free from that barrier, that kind of, um, you know, boundary? Which generation? 
I hope this one that's in the room. Yeah. But. Well, I, you know, I think what I sense with, with young people now, and I fault young people, anybody under 40 really, but, but 30, um, is that there's so much more. I mean, I can feel confidence in this room that I didn't have when I was your age. I mean, I'm going to be really honest about that. Um, it was it was very daunting to go into an interview, or you know, I, I hear I hear so much more empowerment. Some of it's you know movements that are out there. You know, Michelle Obama. You know, when they go low, we go higher. Whether Me Too or whatever. All these all these movements that I think empower women in in very subtle and also very strong ways. And this isn't just about women. This should be for men too. I mean, I I, I think that. Um, and I hope I'm not pie in the sky about this, but I think, like you said, there weren't many, there weren't many mentors. Um, but the more you do it, the more comfortable you are with it. And um, the competitive part of it is just something that you find your passion and, and you'll keep going until you, till you, till you land in your space, I think. I, I kind of feel sorry, if I may, kind of for this generation, because of the technology things yeah. that, mm -hmm. that, like Facebook, mm -hmm. the bullying and those type of things. And, and just the suicides in Ohio yeah. and those type of things, and they're mostly female suicides. I, I just don't understand it. Um, I really don't. And, and that girls and women, young women, can be so catty and so cruel. And yeah, I, I, it's you know, on resources, um, and she's correct. Um, and I think, you know, when I look at the political scene and those type of things, there's some things that are limited in resource, but not love not compassion, not those type of things, because those things are limitless, though. So. I was, um, tell, I was reading, uh, the, a friend of mine um, does some work with, with uh, you know, just um, self-esteem and whatnot, and she was telling me with, with her study that a girl's self-esteem peaks at seven. Seven years old. I mean, in, at that point, the only thing you see is what you, uh, you, is the only thing you know about your image or whatnot is what you hear at home and what you see on television or, or through the media. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, it's really important when I, when I, mm -hmm. I talk to, to young women about, you know, having families and coaching and whatnot, I'm like, sure you can do it. You can do it. Don't stop doing this because you got a child. You know, um, I think... Mm -hmm. Administrators are getting more sensitive to um, allowing coaches to take their children with them. Um, maybe not all the time, but on occasion, or to take their families with them. Um, I, I know as a coach, my, you know, as, as in my position, I make sure that, you know, I mean, you, you got to bring your kids to work, bring your kids to work. I haven't seen them in a while. If you need to travel with them, that's fine. If the kids get sick, you know, hey, we've got six people that can cover for you. But I think that administrators have to have a sense of um, ownership mm -hmm. in, making, in making certain that women have resources to do this job. Women have got to have the resources in terms of mentoring. They've got to have workshops. They've got to have professional development. They've got to have networking. You know, they've got to have, um, they have, they have to have the ability to make mistakes and not have that ruin your career. You know, um, but I think that that's where administrators yeah. have to change, you know, um, in order to meet the needs of, of what women want to do right now. You can have your family and you can cook your dinners. You know, like I said, I spent all day on Sunday cooking. It's fun. And then I've got food for the rest of the week. And then they get takeout. You know, they deliver in grub hub and everything else. You know, there's all kind of ways to eat. Knows how to cook. But, but yes. and also, but and and for the men, I remember. Um, of course, it might have been Chronicle of Higher Education, what have you. They also have the burnout and the stress and the they family do. issues. And there are athletic administrators who are leaving Division One institutions to go to Division Three, so they can spend more time with their families mm -hmm. and those type of things. You see more and more. Um, coaches and those type of things taking leaves of leaves of absences because of health issues or some other things because of the stress. Um, so you know the stress and stressors and and family life and those type of things and the importance of that is not just a female issue; it's a male right. issue as well. Let me add to that also. Um, do you have a question? No. Uh, I was done. Oh, yeah, I was, no, go ahead. You sure? Actually, I'm going to say it because Please. I was like thinking about this whole time. We're, we're, we're so here for you. I see that there is this almost like this gender role that women seem to have 
Um, and then I don't know if it's more of that biological clock thing happening that women seem to have these relationships in the forefront. And then we see it administrative that women are having, like, are maybe like single or no families. And then I don't know, I'm using an example, like maybe mm. let's say Urban Meyer like mm. has huge, like he has the coach, the coach thing going on. He has a family and whatnot. Is that what like we see as like every coach has that? And, like why are no. we seeing women like having that? So I don't know if it's more of the general roles that we're battling in. But he has a contract with his family, if I understand yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he has a contract with his family yeah. about spending time away and how much time he'll spend at home and wow. going to contests and those type of things yeah, yeah. from the Florida burnout. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So I don't know if it's uh, more of those gender roles that we're yeah. kind of battling as women. I think that's a really fair leadership position. I think that's yeah. a that's a fair point, but I also think that mm -hmm. you know you the world is changing. and You have to make your own priorities. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you're talking about your your guy that that you lost. He lost you. Yes, you know, so it, it, it's it's um, I, I see it more as a contract with. I mean, I've, the relationship I've been in. If, if I got out of it, it, was because we didn't have the same common values. Mm -hmm. so we didn't want the same things. Mm -hmm. We didn't want. You know, we were not in the right space at the at the same time or whatever. So there are a lot of reasons that you, besides a guy won't pack up and move with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean that's not generally the reason why relationships break up. Mm -hmm. But um, but you raise a really good question. I'd be that's curious to see what everybody else thinks about that. And just because you're not married doesn't mean you're not in a relationship. Because some relationships are better than folks' marriages. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's another workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get this question. I love what guys are speaking. Please. All right. Um, do you think in the future we will see more women uh, collegiately and professionally coaching men? Mm -hmm. And do you think there's a, um, an issue that you've encountered is an unwillingness for men to be taught or coached by a woman? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. uh, you know, this is going to seem like a strange answer, but I'm going to say yes and yes. You will see more women coaching men's teams. It, may, it probably will start not at the, at the women's basketball or football level, obviously. It'll start more with Olympic sports. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're already seeing some of that, some crossover, especially when there's when there's mm -hmm. mental women's track teams, mm -hmm. swimming, those kinds of things. Um, mm -hmm. But it, to your, you made this point earlier. If I had to start my career over again, honestly, I would probably go Division Three. Mm -hmm. There's a lot less stress. Yeah. There's Division One athletics, which I've been in for my entire career. It is it is a hard hard business. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned there's only a few people that are at the pinnacle who are making the money. Um, it, higher education it was not built for college athletics at the Division One level. Mm -hmm. It's not sustainable as a business model. We're all losing money. It's probably only five schools in the country. The yeah. Ohio State might be one of them making money, yeah. but it, it's just it's not what coaches are making. I mean, come on. I love Urban Meyer. I, if you walked in, I'd give him a hug. But he's making seven million bucks. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean. Come on, man. Yeah. I mean, and, his, and his coordinators are making over a million. The yeah, number of yeah. So yeah. it's it's uh, the presidents, in my opinion, mm -hmm. lost control of college athletics mm -hmm. a long time ago. It's going to be hard to put the the uh, toothpaste back in the tube. But the the value systems, I think, in Division two II and three are a lot better. Mm -hmm. We have about yeah. four minutes left, so we have time for maybe a couple. Sure. Well, a couple more questions. Nicole, you had something. Yeah, I just wonder if we could talk a little bit about the media aspect right. of this panel um, mm -hmm. and. You know, it, there's a lot of things that we do that uh, keep women in the place where they are and, and maybe keep them down in a lot of ways. You know, I think about the way that we cover sports, um, gymnastics. Uh, women's volleyball is amazingly popular at, at, during the Olympics. I don't know if it's, uh, they're amazing athletes, but they also wear very skimpy outfits. Um, you know, we have a lot of sexualization right. of female athletes yeah, that we, we certainly don't volleyball. see with men. Um, we, you know, Alyssa and I have talked a lot about the, the women who come into our class and say they want to be sideline reporters, and we advocate they not wear those clothes again. Um, so I'm curious, kind of how do we? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy in some ways. How do we break free from that when, when this is kind of what we see and, and what we have? Please. Um, with that issue, I just think we can't. People, we need to call people out on it, honestly, because mm -hmm. it's. I mean, I look around, all the people I work with are men. So it's it's really hard to speak up on those things and for them to recognize it, especially because um, it's just, we're so used to it. And it's one of those things, it's like, it, we, we just have to start speaking up about it, I really think. Um, I think more women need to just get in the industry and um, the doors are slowly opening. I mean. They, there's a lot of women that now I can say I look up to and um, that have kind of opened the door for 
may like Maria Taylor, Jamal Hill, those are big prominent people that are not just doing sideline reporting. They're big voices in the sports industry and they've kind of been able to pave that way. But mm-hmm. once more women can get in the industry and work their way up and not just looked at as sideline reporters, then I think people will stop kind of sexualizing these sports and all mm-hmm. that stuff. I actually had someone today tell me um, when I was covering a game that he believes that sideline reporters are stupid. And that is the stereotype that is being put out. It's mm-hmm. that, and I mean, you look at most of them, they're blondes. So it's just feeding into this stereotype right. continuously. And we need to start fighting for just these bigger roles. I, and I, you tell us all the time, shoot higher, reach higher, because they're, that's not the only place in sports that and we talked to, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're sorry. And we talked about women and, and young girls and, and when a couple of sideline reporters had bad hair days, mm. the African-American ones, mm-hmm. you know, they were just, and when the, the gymnast yes. had a bad hair yes. day, yes. you know, yes. during the Olympics after mm-hmm. she won four or five gold medals, <laughs> I mean, and all you're going to talk about is her hair. Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. stupid yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And why do you aspire to be a sideline reporter if there's 28 NFL teams, there's 28 That's sidelines, right. there's 28 jobs, and there's so many other jobs in sports. Mm-hmm. Like I said, in event management, you want to aspire to one of 28 jobs? So, yeah. Let me add to that real quick, and then we're going to move and transition. Jane Kennedy. <laughs> Good research on that name. Jane Kennedy. Yeah, she didn't know a lot. Okay. Mm-hmm. Jane Kennedy. Hannah Storm. Jane Kennedy was the first woman to break into the male all dominant sport broadcasting. Had a storm. I'm saying this because you need to know the history of women who have gone before you because they laid that groundwork. A lot has not changed, but do the research of those women who have gone before you and paved the way. Because so often when you don't know the history, you don't know how to get to where you're going. So give homage to those who are still living, by the way and read their research and their background. So it's about 8.20, we're going to look at wrapping up, but I want to give my panelists some quick responses. Uh, Finish the sentence for me, ladies. Diversity is? One word, diversity is? Important. Important. Acceptance? Inclusion. Inclusion? Okay. Diversity is? Us. Roxanne? I was gonna say inclusion, but let me, uh, that's okay. Like, yeah. <laughs> Leadership is? Yeah. Important. Sports is? Empowering. Mm-hmm. Winning is? Winning. Winning, Winning. Winning is? <laughs> Which necessary. Says, necessary. Necessary. Yeah. necessary? <laughs> That's good. Okay. Success is? Personal. Hmm. And life is? Beautiful. Wonderful. We want to conclude at this point in terms of our time. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. It's been my pleasure along with Dr. Pia and Nicole Kraft. And you've heard her talk also in terms of sports and society to be a part of this team to put this initiative together. Let me leave you with this, with this point. I want you to stress how and go after being significant rather than being successful. I'm going to repeat that. Research how to be significant in your life rather than being successful. And that's going to be another follow-up series of what to do because success is temporary, but significance is long-term. Okay? Please. You know, I want to thank the panel uh, for being here. Really appreciate your willingness to come here and provide some real insights um, to all the um, uh, folks in, in the audience. Uh, I know your time is, is valuable. You have a lot of other things that you could have been doing. So we're very happy that you spent uh, some of that time with us this evening. If I can ever be of service, let me know again. Uh, I'm a professor and associate director of the School of Communication. So if you need anything, please reach out to me and I'll email all of you so you have my contact information. I forgot all of my cards. But I would like to uh, bring up uh, Shayla, who is the president of the Black Advertising and Strategic Communication Association. Yes, Shayla. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a little token of our appreciation. Thank you so much. Tell them what they want. Thank you. Probably not what you're thinking, but.
I want to thank our, our uh, all of our athletes who came in, who came here this evening. Uh, I know we have a number of, of athletes who are uh, in attendance, especially uh, Lauren uh, Sherry, who actually played just a couple of hours ago. She plays lacrosse, and they had a game at 4 o'clock, and right after her game, she came right over here. That, that's how important this issue is for so many folks here. And also, I want to um, let the men know I really appreciate your presence here Absolutely. because as we mentioned before, this isn't just a, a woman's issue. This is a men's issue. Um, everybody is impacted by this issue. So I really appreciate your presence here because it shows how important this issue is to you. So again, um, really appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, I really appreciate the panel. And uh, We'll hope to do this more and more uh, in the future. So thanks again. Thank you. Uh, yeah, 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 Oh, no. Question. Yeah, but you know, Ladies, come on over real quick. Uh, let's, let's get in front of this one. Yeah. Okay.